Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. So five, four, three, two, and one. Our right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. Very excited to have as my guest today, Andy Colbert. Andy, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. You are welcome. So Andy is a licensed professional counselor, speaker, and author of the groundbreaking book, Try Softer, and its companion, The Try Softer Guided Journey. She's the owner of Colbert Counseling LLC, established in 2009. In addition to her MA in community counseling, she's received additional training in her specialization of trauma and body-centered therapies, including the highly researched and regarded eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy. As a survivor of trauma and a lifelong learner, she brings hard-won knowledge around the work of change, the power of redemption, and the beauty of experiencing God with us in our pain. She's the author of her most recent work, Strong Like Water, Finding the Freedom, Safety, and Compassion to Move Through Hard Things and Experience True Flourishing, Andy. Welcome. Mm-hmm. Thank so you. Before we Thanks start, so wh- what's Andy? Where's that from? What is that? <laughs> what's that background? Yeah. So actually, my full name is Andrea. And um, growing up, like nobody ever got it right. Like it was so rare for someone to actually consistently call me, uh, Andrea instead of Andrea, or, um, it it just folks always got it wrong. And so Andy was sort of a nickname of mine when I was especially younger, but then I started to play a lot of sports. Um, and Andy, like my peers started calling me that, and it just became something that uh, felt more like me. And so as I've grown and really even in my own healing journey, um, I kind of identify more, you know, just from the sense of like, when someone says Andy, that feels like me versus Mm -hmm. Andrea. I'm like, that's me. Like it's, it's on my professional things, you know? Okay. That makes sense. (laughs) All right, Andy, let's, uh, let's get going here. Well, before we go, actually share with the listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Yeah, so I am from Astoria, Oregon, a small town on the the very corner of the Pacific Northwest. Um, So actually grew up surrounded by so much water, which probably speaks a little bit to my love of water. Um, And then I spent 17 years in Colorado and now live um, in Western Michigan. Okay, awesome. All right, so let's dive in here. How did you get here? (laughs) Yes. Not a small question. Yes. Yeah. But so I, um, I'll just give you a little bit of background. I, I grew up, um, in a, a pretty significantly dysfunctional family, um, quite a bit of developmental trauma, attachment trauma experienced a lot of verbal, emotional abuse. And so, Part of how I coped with that was by becoming someone who basically was like, well, I'll just figure it out on my own. So like going out into the world and, you know, essentially finding ways to achieve or prove or hustle Um, because that I experienced a sense of at least some sense of safety from that. And so where my journey took me ultimately was to become, I, I would, I got really interested. I've always been interested in people. I've always been fascinated by people. And so even before I had a sense of how much trauma I had, <laughs> because for a long time, I would not have identified um, personally as being a trauma survivor. I thought, you know what? Yeah, there were some hard There were some hard experiences, um, but I didn't really have a lot of language um, to that. And so part of my journey was that I was really attracted to this field, to this field of healing and what could be possible, um, but initially really didn't understand my own story. And so for about the last 15 years, um, a lot, I've had a lot of different experiences through my own therapy, through my own 
relational work where I've come to understand much more (laughs) my own story, my own pain. And that has had sort of this reciprocal effect with my therapeutic work that I began to realize that a lot of the clients I worked with who maybe they knew about a lot of things, they had some good knowledge, but it didn't transfer to how they lived. It didn't, it wasn't a felt experience of, of things like safety or connection a lot of times. And so I guess it's a long way to say, um, that, you know, this has been a journey of living into something, something that, um, has been inside me before I even knew where I was going. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was a, a therapist for about eight years and I started doing some writing Right, just hold, on, ex- hold, on, hold on, hold on. Before you get there, mm-hmm. uh, you you said you know you grew up in a significantly dysfunctional. We're talking like from z- at age one forward. When did- uh, yes, I mean, okay. there's not a there's not a time. I mean, I identify as having complex trauma. Um, and I would just say, you know, I'm a little bit mindful of how much of my story I tell because of siblings and different things. But what I would just say is that both parents with pretty severe mental health histories, addiction, uh, familial trauma. Um, and so there was just like a lot of layers. Sure. sure. Um, and yeah, and I'm, I'm not expecting you to, to share anything, but what I'm yeah. trying to get a, get an understanding of is at what point did you realize something, something, not just something, but trauma has happened? Yeah. So this is the question, right? That like, it, even as you say that, I'm like, I, I, it's not, it's not that it's like a, it's not a funny question. It's that what I've come to realize is that I'm not alone in my experience of thinking that your life was more normal than it actually like like thinking that you something you went through was normal and then you come to realize that not everybody experienced so much terror and Mm. so much fear and so much disconnection and so what i would say is that it was gradual like when i was younger what i would say um was that i knew things weren't completely okay i knew that there was um, difficulty, like my parents had a very just, um, their marriage was explosive and scary at times. And, um, you know, my father is profoundly, uh, he's an abu- a very abusive person. And so there were like multiple experiences of, wow, that was, that was a lot. That was weird. Um, but I think what I would say is that I never felt like I had permission um, to say, oh, I'm a trauma survivor. That felt like it was reserved, um, especially 20 years ago, uh, for Mm -hmm. someone who'd been through something very specific, like you've been through a car accident in this way. So now you are, or you, uh, are a soldier and you came back from war. And so now you, you get to have that. Um, So I would just say that for me, it really, I didn't even identify as having experienced complex trauma um, until probably about 10 years ago. Um, I was well into being a therapist. I would have said, yeah, I had a dysfunctional, like, you know, there's alcoholism in my family. I would have said, yes, um, I've had to have multiple interventions with both of my parents. Yes, I was parentified. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was over-responsible. Yes, I was hypervigilant. Yes, I even, I I wouldn't have known the word dissociation, but yes, I checked out. Um, And I still didn't think that was enough. Mm-hmm. At what point was there a point during that time where you sought out therapy? Um, so when I got into graduate school, I did. So it wasn't until you got into graduate school. Mm-hmm. Okay. And was that for what reason? Was it because you were required to, or was it for a, a, mm-hmm. a particular reason other than trauma? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would say that. I mean, it was partly because I was required to, but it's, I also wanted to. And I would say that during that time was one of the times where um, 
simultaneously many hard things were happening in my family. Like that um, is when I no longer had a relationship with my, my dad. Like, I mean, it was just profound loss and I still didn't quite put together how bad it was. And um, so even in that time, uh, originally I went to a therapist and to be honest, I didn't find them to be that helpful. (laughs) Like, like they didn't, cause I was very high functioning. I was, I was able to present, I could articulate myself really well. And that's what was always my challenge is that it was almost like, because I looked like I was okay. I didn't, people didn't think I needed the support that I actually did. Mm-hmm. Was there a therapist you encountered who, when things did change for you? Yeah. Later, later on, I mean, there was, I had a, a, an, a really helpful mentor as well. Um, I would say around the time that I was first going to therapy and I would say that had some therapeutic significance for me because it started to begin to repair some of the, some attachment things. Um, and so, but like a little bit later, probably like five years later, um, I had been in some different therapeutic settings, like groups and things. So it's like I was I was into that work, but I but I still didn't feel like I had quite that therapeutic experience that I was looking for. And then in the last 10 years, especially, I would say I've had multiple therapeutic relationships that have been really, really helpful, really supportive, have just Mm -hmm. continued to help me in my own journey. Was there can you point to a particular experience when someone was able to kind of look behind the curtain of your sure yeah yeah one of the things that i write about um in in both of my books actually is the has been the significance for me of the safe attachment with my husband um he was a person, like I would say in my life, that was one of the first people that I felt truly deeply safe with, like my body felt settled. And that allowed me, um, it's not that I was always perfectly put together around other people. It's just that I would only let so much come out and then I would shave myself and be like, pull it back in, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, that experience, you know, early in my twenties, probably, you know, we started dating when I was 23. Um, that began to shift my internal templates around safety. And I would say that's the thing that honestly, all other safety, um, in many ways built on was right. Like that co-regulation with him of knowing, like, I can just be exactly where I'm at. And, you know, like one of the stories I tell in my newest book, strong, like water, um, I'm sitting in my parents' house and they're about, um, they are going through this, just this divorce is just gone haywire. Like it's so stressful and I'm visiting and we're having to pack up the house. I only have like two days before, um, I have to leave again to go back to Colorado. And so essentially what I know is that this is the last time I'll ever get to see my childhood home. And it felt like a funeral. I mean, it just was like, Oh, the grief, you know, of just years and years of so much pain. Um, and so I'm sitting in the living room And just feeling just profoundly alone, knowing that, and that's the thing that wasn't, um, like it was familiar to me to feel alone in those kinds of experiences. The thing that was different is that, um, I had, we had just been married for about two years, my husband and I, and he was there with me. And I, you know, at the time it was just, you know, he's sort of like in the background, whatever, like doing his thing. And the thing that shifted in my, even in my memory is that he came and and he came and sat with me as the tears are just falling down my face. And it seems like such a simple thing, but it was like that experience of truly in a very visceral way, knowing I wasn't alone began to allow me to grieve in a way that was actually helpful like versus just being stuck in the experience, like it it could begin 
to actually process and shift. Um, and so I would say, you know, though that wasn't obviously a therapeutic relationship, it's been a healing relationship. And so many of my experiences that in the, in the decades, you know, like the, the decade and a half that's followed, um, have built on those experiences of, of that kind of safety. Appreciate you sharing that, um, and coming on here and, and talking about that in the first place. What was it that inspired you to be, get into the field? I think I, I really, well, I'm a very curious person. And so I think that I was, I'm fascinated by people. Um, so I think that was a part of it. Just like, why do we do what we do? You know, like what, what are, what are we about? How do we tick? I think that's a part of it, but I think it was also, um, without even being able to identify it then, I think it was partly about my, about myself. I mean, it was partly like, you know, wanting to understand more deeply my own story and then wanting to sit like at the time I probably would have thought about it as saving, but now I, I wouldn't, but think of it as saving, but as wanting to walk alongside folks to empower mm -hmm. folks as they do their own healing work. <laughs> What do you think are some of the the, the, the qualities of the elements in you that has helped you along your healing journey? I mean, because it sounds like it's been, I mean, for lack of a better word, crazy intense and hellish, quite frankly. It's... Yeah. I mean, it's true. It's like, there's a part of me when I hear that, I'm like, Oh, I know, but it's, it has, it has been, um, yeah, I turned 40 in a month and it's so symbolic to me. So my book, this new book comes out the month that I turned 40. And that for me just feels like this beautiful reclamation of so much grief, so much suffering in my life. Um, and so, you know, going back to your question, I think that I have, I have a, I have a tenacity in me that when I was younger developed in order to survive. But at the same time, I had, I'm like highly sensitive, which seems very paradoxical that they can coexist. And at times that has created quite a polarization in me. But what has been so satisfying in my own journey is to see that the longer I move towards, you know, integration, trauma resolution, those types of experiences is that those qualities in me, they become such beautiful resources. They have become such beautiful resources that I just, I bless in myself, like the tenacity piece. It, it, it takes some tenacity, right? Just to continue. I mean, particularly trauma work. Whew. Let's go. Like it's, mm -hmm. it is not the kind of work like that, you know, sometimes I think about it, like you're kind of st standing on the edge of a cliff with someone and, and it's sort of like you're trying to walk them along this cliff. You don't want to fall in, but we're just trying to make sure, like, we're trying to figure out what we need maybe from, you know, from this pit mm -hmm. and we're trying not to fall in. And so, so that tenacity has mattered. Um, but I would say the thing that I've had to really develop in my adulthood is my softness. And so, you know, my first book is called Try Softer. And that, has, that first book has very much been about recognizing that I didn't have the space to be soft with myself in many ways when I was growing up because I, I couldn't, I, I, it it really would have been a liability almost. And when you, uh, when you, when you say define soft for the listeners. Yeah. Well, so here's what I'll say in my, in try softer. I actually, I, it's a whole framework that I, I see through the lens of being able to pay compassionate attention to our experience. Um, and really, I, I think that definition 
actually still works with softness because it's almost like when we can honor and listen uh, and validate our experience, we can soften. We can say, okay, my body goes, I'm heard. It's like I, uh, my needs are going to get met or at least be validated. Um, So there's a sense in which we don't have to be in our defensive mode. Mm -hmm. And I think of that, like that's softer, right? And for some of us, um, we have had to be in defensive modes and that has kept us from being able to be softer, to be gentler, to, to be able to um, attune and listen and tend. Um, and so, and so that whole journey, you know, basically this first book that my first book was try softer. And then my second book is strong like water. And there is this beautiful fullness in that. What inspired you? We're going to get to the, the, the most recent book here, but what inspired you to write that first book? You know, I think what inspired me to write that book is I wrote it from the place of this is the book I wish I could have given myself when I was like 18, mm-hmm. 20. Um, cause it, it, it took me, I wrote the book that I felt at the time, like hadn't, didn't quite exist yet. Um, and certainly there's, there is, there are some great resources out there. So I don't want to like say that there's not, um, but I really wrote it from, you know, I'm a pretty eclectic therapist. Um, so I bring in things like interpersonal neurobiology and polyvagal theory and self-compassion and mindfulness and, you know, some DBT. And um, I I sort of wanted to say, okay, here's all these ideas and they have been so helpful to me and to my clients. And I just want to bring them to one place and to maybe not tell the like complete story of my life, but to just be able to weave in Mm -hmm. some elements of my story. I wanted my reader to know, like, I get it. Like I get it. And this work, it is so much harder than most people will ever really acknowledge. And I just want you to know, I know how hard this work is. So I'm speaking with Andy Kolber. The, her most recent book is called Strong Like Water, Finding the Freedom, Safety, and Compassion to Move Through Hard Things and Experience True Flourishing. So how did this sec- this book come about? Yeah, so this book, I'm really excited about this book. I think that for me in many ways, um, I don't know if the, I'm pronouncing this right, but there's a quote and I think it's from Lao Tzu. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right. But he says, what is soft is strong. And so, you know, Try softer at first was like this experience of it just this vital, important part part of my healing. And it's something that I'll never, I mean, it's always going to continue to be a part of my healing, but I see strong like water as almost like softness cannot help, but birth strength, like true generative softness births a strength in us. And so strong like water is almost like, for me, sort of like panning out the video, like, like a, like a movie camera. And it's about, I think, what it means to be human. I think it's about, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it has stories and it has research, but it's also, you know, I introduced some sort of some theory around here's what I think and how I believe we can redefine strength. Um, our culture, we have a very narrow view of strength. Mm-hmm. And because that view is so narrow, I think that especially those of us who have had to be strong in a very specific way, um, we feel this sense of like, man, I don't want to accept help because, because that wouldn't be strong. Oh, I don't, I don't want to be compassionate towards myself because oof, 
that wouldn't be strong. <laughs> you know, like there's all these implicit ideas about, about strength. And for me, you know, I have just had an, I've had an ambivalent relationship with that experience of strength. I have carried that heavy burden for many, many years of my life. And I've, I've seen other people carry that burden. And I just, there's almost like this fire in my belly that is sort of is like, you know, I don't really want this word strength to have to so be associated with experiencing harm all the time. Like Mm -hmm. maybe strength is more. And yes, like there are times when we really, all we can do is survive. Like sometimes that is the only way through. And that is strong. But also like we are made and designed for so much more. We are, we, you know, what's the quote? We contain multitudes and I don't want for myself and I don't want for others to have to believe that you have to live this narrow life, this tiny contracted small life to be strong. I don't think that that's really, um, doesn't do justice to the, like the fullness of how people are created. I think there's a lot more to us. Wow. I mean, you can feel your energy on the (laughs) seriously and your passion. And I'm thinking to myself, you have so much to give and, um, yeah, it's, it's, you're pretty amazing. Um, how do people reach you? What's mm. the best way? Yeah. Um, well, you can find me at my website, ondicolber.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at ondicolber, uh, sorry, at ondicolber, or you can find me on Twitter at ondicolber. Okay. Ondicolber.com. Um, your books are up there. And um, I'll have these linked up at the show notes page at the trauma therapist podcast.com. I'd love to have you back at a later time. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for, for mm. being here and sharing your story and your heart. Mm. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate All right. It. Take care. Yeah.